Welcome to the Cover to Cover Book Beat. I'm your host, Roger Nichols. Our guest today really does know her way to Sesame Street. Dr. Lucille Burbank has worked in educational media and technology toward the advancement of education and special education for several decades. She's consulted for NASA, the New Jersey Department of Civil Service, and more importantly, for the Sesame Workshop. She's also achieved the dream of every PhD, turning her doctoral dissertation into a best-selling book. The Inside Secrets of Sesame Street. The newly published third edition expands the definitive 50 year celebration of Sesame Street, as well as offers insights into two other sterling programs, Captain Kangaroo and Mr. Rogers Neighborhood. She was recently honored as author of the decade and inducted into the Hall of Fame of the International Association of Top Professionals. She received the Albert Nelson McKee Lifetime Achievement Award, was named Top Female Executive by Worldwide Branding, among other honors. We're very pleased to welcome Dr. Lucille Burbank. Well, I'm glad to be here. Thank you for that lovely introduction. You bet. You know, I should tell you that I read the book before I checked the biographies in order to take the material without any preconceptions. And so doing, I thought the style in part reminded me of a paper in a peer-reviewed journal with all those citations in the text. So I was delighted to discover it started as an actual dissertation. Did you have any idea when you started research it was going to be this big? No, no, I... It, it was exciting. What happened was I was getting my doctorate while I was consulting at the workshop, at the Sesame Workshop. And, um, you know, you always have to pinpoint something. And my field is educational media. So, of course, working at Sesame Street was great. But then I thought, oh, my gosh, um, I did get a scholarship. So I was able to expand my study. And so I included Captain Kangaroo and Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. And it just blossomed because the pioneers were there. Yeah. And I could let them talk. And they gave me long interviews, um, three or four hours. I loved it. Well, you've got marvelous quotes. Sunny days, sleeping out. McGrath, who was the um, actor on Sesame Street, uh, music teacher, when it first uh, aired, uh, November 10th, 1969, I went to his, first of all, I called him and I said, I'm at Temple University in Philadelphia, I'm doing this, and should, uh, and I explained the whole thing, and should I send you some verification um, from the university? He said, nobody in their right mind would be doing this. But at any rate, I did go up and he and I talked for three hours. And then I said, I'm sorry, I don't have any more uh, blank audio cassettes. And he got up, went over to his cabinet and said, look, open the door. And grandly said, look at all these blank cassettes. We can keep talking. <laughs> That's a great story. I, I love it. So um, when was your dissertation originally published? It was published in 1993. Mm, okay. All right. So, and then 
I'm looking at it. I'm looking at it because I was never an author. Um, you know, I, I never, um, I would love to have written a book, but I, I thought, oh, gee. And then Sesame Street was celebrating its 40th anniversary. And I'm thinking, oh, it's so rigid in my dissertation because of the rules and things like mm -hmm. that. I must get it out because these people have given me such fantastic information, um, knowledge, wisdom, everything. Um, so I started, I just started never writing a book myself. I just sat down one day and started and then kept going and kept going and kept going. And pretty soon um, I had a text version, not the pictorial version that is called the Inside Secrets of Sesame Street. Mm -hmm. The text version is more of a one for libraries and it's called Secrets from Sesame Street's Pioneers, how they produced a successful television series. Mm -hmm. And it talks a lot about the television model. And then the critics came and said, hey, we want pictures. And I thought, oh, my gosh, the Muppets are so heavily guarded and copyrighted. Mm -hmm. I'll never be able to do it. And then my mother said, yes, you can. <laughs> <laughs> and I went in my archives and I was able to do a pictorial version of it. And I really appreciate that too, because uh, as I was reading it, I'd stop and show my wife here. This is this is what this this picture is like, and it's, you know, because I, I I was doing the electronic version on my iPad, and it was wonderful. I, I really appreciated that. So, how long did it take you to get the first the first edition out? When was that happening? Well, let me see. I started in about August two thousand eight. And um, I would write a, maybe about three times a week, take a break. Um, so it came out, the first text only came out November 22nd, which wasn't the best day, but at any rate, um, uh, let me see, it was 19, okay, so it was, I'm sorry, 2013, it came out, mm -hmm. uh, November 22nd and in, in, in respect to John F. Kennedy, but at any yeah. rate, that's when it was on online. Right, and, and this newest edition is, is a third edition, as I understand correctly. Yes, let me explain. Um, with, the, with the text, I really wanted to keep the same text when I did the nostalgic and, and pictorial version. So you have to call it a second edition, and then you call it a third edition, because else because else why you're you're plagiarizing yourself if you say mm -hmm. it's a new book it isn't a new book right. the text is the same but i wanted to add pictures and i thought gee you know with well, there's a nostalgic one they'll they'll read what they want and let mm -hmm. let go of the rest and so why should i dilute it or no, or scale it down it, it's great because it's an interesting combination it's kind of a trio thing you've got your own observations, which you make in first person, you have some third person stuff, and you have all these wonderful citations, which are just like a just like a dissertation with the, you know, Brown 1968, and then the link <laughs> in the back with all the exact information so somebody can actually go and look up the source. So, yeah, it was important to keep the research component uh, mm -hmm. in it. Mm -hmm. And yeah, so it, it was a good call, but that's why it's called uh, second and third edition. Okay. And the things that I found interesting is that you list the major reasons for its initial success and also the reasons for, or the factors that kept it going. And those aren't the same necessarily, but if you have to go back to 1969, what was going on? Um, we were having the great society, we were having inner city riots. People were starting to get oh. concerned about kids watching television and only knowing the songs and the commercials being some of those factors there. And uh, it it was just a, the perfect storm to come together to make what it did. It really was because, you know, as we remember in uh, the latter 60s, uh, some of us at any rate, um, it was a can-do in the air, really. And the workshop saw a need 
They didn't like what was happening on, on television and also on children's television. You have to remember uh, Peggy Sharon's action for children's television was developing, came out at that time. The Sergeant uh, General's study on te TV violence was out. And so they said, hey, we can do this. We can change television and we can make something of it and have it reach its potential. At least let's try and go there. And that was the explosion and the exciting time of the 60s. Man had walked on the moon. Mm -hmm. And the Mets and won the World Series the same year. Who could imagine? Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> so, many of the factors I found interesting because you know, there's a few that you think, you know, they have some creative people and it was kind of nifty and they borrowed a lot of things from uh, using animation and whatnot. We start to get into the, the detail on it and the fact that behind the scenes, which I enjoyed reading in the book, like the fact that they treated researchers and creative people equally and they met on a common ground. Oh, that is really a beautiful aspect of their of the Sesame Workshops television model. This trust between producers and researchers. This had never been done before, and uh, in fact, Joan Cooney, the uh, co-creator of Sesame Street, used to say, "Hey, take a producer out to lunch to the researchers, and vice versa, so you know what questions to ask, what can be asked, what can be studied." And it it turned out to be phenomenal for both groups. Um, for instance, in the beginning, as I explain in the book, about 1968, about a year before Sesame Street went on the air, Dr. Palmer, uh, co-creator of research, tested out some segments teaching the letter J. And the producers went there with their intuitive uh, abilities and what has always worked. And Dr. Palmer tested these out on the target audience and said, hey, the preschoolers did not learn the letter J. They did zone in and zoom in on the educational, I mean, on the entertainment elements, uh, the June bug dancing and so forth. But that was on the lower right hand screen. And then the letter J was on the upper upper left hand screen and it was separated it was like two two screens and so dr Palmer said hey you've got to get the letter as a character in the action so then we have kermit the frog lecturing on the letter w and as he's talking about walk and wander and so forth the w is coming towards him and he's looking around going oh my gosh um, what's this W doing? And pretty soon the W smashes him and he goes, oh, whoa with me. And so you've got a little bit of animation, a little cartoonish, if you will, but the letter is integrated. And then you've got Wanda the witch and her wig and the going there, Wanda the witch is weird and she wore a wig on Wednesdays and so forth in the wind and it was blowing and all that repetition of the W is so beautiful. It's such a philosophy of Sesame Street because they believe in repetition and creative repetition as a key factor in learning. Mm -hmm. I, you mentioned several others that I, I noticed and one of the keys, I think the continuing success is what it portrays. This is, this is not, some glitzy Hollywood thing. This is a real on the street kind, even though it's a set, it's a set that's where a lot of the people live, brownstones and stoops and, and all of that sort of thing. And it's a society where everyone is integrated and treated with respect. And that is a Tolerance. model that the kids pick up on. Yeah, and you know, they wanted to make it relevant to their target audience. And that was their target audience, more of all ethnic groups coming together, being in the city. And um, they wanted to show using live people how tolerance could happen, how all kinds of people could get together and uh, be there for each other, belong together and be happy together. And you know, Bob McGrath, when I was interviewing him, he said to me, I was in Newark airport and this 
black woman uh, behind the desk or counter said to me, hey, Bob, you know, waved, hi, how are you? And and I, I recognize you from Sesame Street and Bob's going, oh, yes, and we taught you a lot. And she said, she got really serious and stopped and said, well, yes, you did. You taught me that all kinds of people could get along together and I never knew that was possible. Yeah. And that is the joy of live people, though, to model that kind of behavior. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And having and having the the Muppets there um, in certain ways attracts other parts of it. Uh, One of the things you point out is, is that that you can be a little more you can actually be a little violent with puppets and it doesn't disturb the kids. Yes. And, And so you can show conflict there in a way that's not frightening. Yes, John Stone was very good. Um, He was the executive producer, producer, director of Sesame Street, also head writer, and really loved the show. And he and I talked a great deal about that. And he said, you know, the, the puppets or Muppets can do things that live people cannot do. They can be, for instance, Cookie Monster can be incorrigible. He can sell his soul to the devil for a cookie. And you really can have that in a, a role model and mm-hmm. in a person. And the count can count coconuts or grains of sand. And, you know, you can't imagine a person doing that. But what was so great about the Muppets, and they did kind of become the star of Sesame Street, even though Dave Cano, the executive producer said, we didn't want a star, but oh my gosh. Mm -hmm. But um, the great thing is they were such food for the writer's imaginations. They could just use the characters of the Muppets and go there with the letters and the shapes and the numbers and, and, they could just imagine how that Muppet would portray or teach that uh, learning mm-hmm. concept. Yeah, in which you, know, you got Big Bird, you got Oscar the Crouch, you got Burton Ernie, you got Kermit, you got, let's talk about Im- imagination, Snuffleupagus. Oh, well, only I the kids know. could see and not the adults for so <laughs> long. That, that was a wonderful running, running gag there. It really was. Um, Did you know that Carol Spinney, who was the puppeteer for Big Bird for over 46 years, the late Carol Spinney, Mm -hmm. he died um, December 2019, but um, he also played Oscar the Grouch. And did you know how Oscar the Grouch got his voice? I do because I read the book, but you tell him. Yes. Should I should I share that? Yes. It was fabulous. Um, And it reminds me so much about media that sometimes you're flying by the seat of your pants. Mm -hmm. (laughs) But anyway, I was interviewing him and he said, you know, I could get Big Bird's voice, a couple of three octaves higher. That was no, that was easy. But I'm down to the wire going to the rehearsal with Jim Henson, the creator of the Muppets, and I didn't have Oscar's voice. So I go running to get a cab to go to rehearsal and thinking, well, what am I going to do? And the cab driver says, where to Mac? And and he's chewing on a cigar on the side of his mouth. And he's talking about Lindsay, how he's wrecking the city. And Carol Spinney's going, where to Mac? Where to Mac? And I can't, I can't copy Oscar's voice. You know, where to Mac? Where to Mac? All the way through. And he gets there to the rehearsal and Jim Henson says, well, how do you want to do this? He says, well, let's put Oscar in the, in the trash can. You knock on the trash can and then I will come up. And um, so he, he did that and he rose Oscar. And there was that wonderful voice that we all are familiar with today. And that yeah. cabbie probably has no royalties, but it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> I hope he kind of knows. <laughs> yeah. In fact, one thing we should we should mention about Carol Spinney is that he spent all those years with his arm up over his oh, head, yes. holding big birds high off the ground, like about eight feet up, uh, working the mouth and the eyes and whatever, and, and was able to do it for years. 
he did. He 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 was wonderful. In fact, he was at a party. So actually, the way you do Big Bird, because Carol Spinney is not eight feet tall and yeah. the Muppet is, is you hold up your right hand uh, vertical uh, straight up and then you put it on uh, Big Bird's head, weighed about four and a half pounds. And you put your hand in there and you manipulate the eyelids and the beak and you turn it around. Now, while you're doing that, you have a monitor that's attached to your chest a little bit um, from your chest and you can see just what you're doing on the set and how, how he looks and so forth. So anyway, he was at a party and, you know, people, I get this all the time. People look at things on TV or on the media and they go, oh, it's so easy. Yeah. Well, of course, it's made to look so easy. So he's at this party and this, this guy comes up and says, I can play Big Bird for, I don't know, an hour or something like that. And so Spinney says, all right, put up your arm straight up. You don't even have to put anything in it. Like you don't have to carry Big Bird's head. You don't, I won't put a four and a half pound object in your hand. And I want you to keep it up. And the clock was on the mantle and it was only maybe a couple of minutes before the guy put it down. But Carol Spinney said, you know, in puppetry and when you're doing it, if, if you're comfortable doing it, it's not the right way. Yeah. <laughs> also, I loved when he turned to me and he said to me, and you know what, Seal, I've got great at painting ceilings. <laughs> and he did yeah he, he it was physically of course very exhausting but after a while you know he mm -hmm. could do it but it was very hot also in that costume mm -hmm. there was no air conditioning yeah and i should mention too that one of the added benefits is is because you also have it's not just Sesame Street. You're also talking to Bob Keishan as Captain Kangaroo and talking to Fred Rogers and Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood and integrating all those into the subjects. It's it's a fabulous resource. And it I is. The they are such inspirational, wonderful people of high integrity. integrity. And, uh, with, uh, and about Captain Kangaroo, Captain Kangaroo really was a precursor to Sesame Street because Bob Keeshan, the creator of Captain Kangaroo, believed in educating children, that they weren't being educated enough and challenged enough, and that anything could be explained to them as long as you use the right vocabulary and pictures and so forth. And he did that enrichment, that educational enrichment time and time again. The other thing that people don't realize is that the staff of Sesame Street, the pioneers who created it, came directly from Captain Kangaroo. They were trained there. And in those days, there was training. Mm -hmm. And so they came directly there and they knew and they loved it. So when I'm interviewing them, I can be talking to Dave Connell about Sesame Street. And then we can switch to Bob Keishan and how he, in his gentle manner, presented toys, how he would take these wind up toys from his kangaroo pockets and put them on the table and how his presence and the way he presented them would mesmerize the children. Mm -hmm. So we could go back and forth. So I really, you know, I did some individual interviews, of course, of Bob Keishan, but I, I really would sit with Dave Cano and we'd switch back and forth. <laughs> <laughs> and that comes through very nicely in, in, in the book as was well. well um, thank you. The, one of the, the, in fact, I think both of their personalities and, and Fred Rogers as well comes through and he I would was, like to know them. He, yeah. Fred Rogers, I had to work a year to get him. I had to develop trust and interview the whole staff of the neighborhood before they would let me get to him. And it was wonderful. I only had about 45 minutes. But in that 45 minutes, I, because this is a one-man show, really, mm -hmm. Fred Rogers is the host, the 
puppeteer, the songwriter, the script writer. And it's, it is, and I talk about how that's a one man show. And then we get Sesame Street that has a plethora of people um, as, and then Captain Kangaroo is kind of in the middle of the continuum with about five or six uh, on staff um, or actors. But at any rate, so I'm, I'm interviewing him and I had read something about Fred Rogers that he will turn the interview around and interview you without knowing. And this, and, and Marie Alakis, I think had interviewed him time and time again. And I had read her material and she said, watch out because all of a sudden you'll be in the room, you'll be talking and you'll, and Fred Rogers will be invisible. And it's just you in the room because he's counseling you and, and so forth. So he did turn the tables on me at one point. He did say, oh, Lucille, I understand what happened to you. And I went, OK. And I answered very succinctly, knowing I only had a very small amount of time with him. And then I could, because I had read that and done that research, I could turn it right around and direct it again. Yeah. I just last week watched uh, the Tom Hanks movie um, oh, and he good? did that, and he did that to to uh, uh, the interviewer there and it was it was wonderful I could yeah. see you could see the flip going on in his head he's gonna help everybody that's that was his thing yeah you know Tom Hanks I saw the movie too and I adopted that song it's a snappy a snappy a snappy new day and I would sing that to my dog who had has passed away but she had cancer but we would go there as I would dress her in her little dress and um it was just one of our lovely uh connections but at any rate Tom Hanks did such a fabulous job you I mean I interviewed Fred Rogers and he is he is a complicated he's a difficult person to portray and I believe and even though you could watch the movie and you could still see Tom Hanks there he was close enough to Fred Rogers I don't think anybody else could have gotten that close and portrayed yeah. him as well um I really respect him as an actor yeah a couple of stories really got to me, and, and most of those are how feeding back some of the things that kids did. Um, you talk about uh, Emily Kingsley's son with Down syndrome appearing, ah. and then and then the feedback from this mother in Long Island who wrote about her down. Can you tell that story, please? Oh, yes, that was fabulous. Well, Emily Kingsley, first of all, just to back up a little bit, she watched Sesame Street after its debut in 1970. And she had worked in television um, in various roles before, but uh, she really wanted to work for the show. And so the only uh, position that was open was a writer. And she had never done any TV writing. So she studied it and studied it and went there and was hired as a TV writer. And because, um, she was uh, she was kind of um, not the senior person, but they would send her out like to the uh, theater for the deaf. And she went there and looked at the what they were doing. And uh, of course, they have uh, deaf uh, Linda Bove, I think is her name, if I remember it correctly. They have her on and she would write the material for her. And then she's going along and um, they're talking about Down syndrome um, and her, and yes, that was fabulous. This mother says, hey, I put my one child there and then the child with Down syndrome thinking he'll be entertained, not educated, and the other child will be educated in front of the TV watching Sesame Street. And she goes in one day after um, doing this for a couple of times, and he's the one, the child with Down syndrome stands up and recites the alphabet for her. Well, this was phenomenal because they didn't believe Down syndrome could be educated. And uh, there it was kind of backward. Uh, lo and behold, too, um, Emily uh, was pregnant at that time. And then she discovered she had Jason, who 
is a Down syndrome child or has Down syndrome rather. Um, mm -hmm. And so she could use that. She could use the letter. And they also investigated into the Kennedy Foundation uh, that was there for handicaps and, and so for disability, rather developmental disabilities, I meant to say. And she said, you know, I've got to show parents and give them hope those that have children with Down syndrome, um, that these, these children can be educated. So she had Jason on a number of times doing letters and numbers and showing that. And, and he Jason was there so, so often in showing that education can help. And in interviewing her at her house, uh, Jason had continued with his education. They, he was just maybe a little bit slower than, than other children, but he, he's completely educated. And, um, you know, they told her, hey, he would have to be institutionalized, all this other thing. As I say, so, uh, special ed back then was a bit primitive. Mm -hmm. uh, a little bit too primitive. And... Um, but at any rate, uh, it, it came out. And um, so then we have autism and we mm -hmm. have this beautiful Julia, this autistic, um, you know, little girl, puppet, uh, Muppet, who is um, the puppeteer. Her son is, is autistic and uh, she works. And April, by the way, is autism month mm -hmm. and so the workshop goes there and airs new episodes of julia whether they will be on hbo they'll do it at the same time on hbo or pbs and they just really highlight and they've been doing a lot more work in autism foster care racism uh the pandemic and so there's all these beautiful initiatives floating around. Mm -hmm. One interesting fact that was in the book is you talk about how children with autism related to the puppets and would talk to them. Yes, John Stone said his stepfather called him one time and said, you know, these children will not talk to to the adults, but they will relate to the Muppets and, and they're relating to Bert and Ernie on Sesame Street. And I said to John, well, why do you think that is? He said, well, because they're, they're um, easy to get along with, they're exciting, they're like dolls, they are not threatening and there's no judgment there. Um, and they are like, magical dolls coming to life and talking with you. And then you're in that miracle together. Mm -hmm. it, it, it's so wonderful to, to see all this stuff over the years. And I'm really delightful that you, you talk about the fact that government faded away, but the Muppets, like Hanson's company licensed the characters and the sales of all of that good gear has helped keep the program on the air. Yes, yes, definitely. When I was talking to Joan Cooney about that, she said, you know, they're only fund you for so long and then they're going to reduce their funds. So we had to find another um, way. And um, even after Jim Henson died in 1990, um, there was still that licensing arrangement with the workshop. What's so beautiful about the workshop is is that they were able finally to buy their own Muppets. In other words, there's, there's Muppets like Miss Piggy and um, Fozzie the Bear the other and, and the yeah. Swedish Chef from the Muppet Thank Show. you, yeah. thank you. And they're with Disney, yeah. all right? But there's only Sesame Street Muppets like Elmo and Cookie Monster and Big Bird and Oscar the Grouch and Grover, by the way, you know, oh, that yeah. wonderful dashing waiter <laughs> and so forth and Bert and Ernie and those are Sesame Street Muppets but the workshop was never able to afford to buy their own Muppets and it was always a little risky as I said in the book because Disney could go there and if Disney bought 
the Muppets on Sesame Street, then that would really be problematic yeah. for the show. But they were able to buy it and it all worked out fine. And then with Disney, we see Miss Piggy. Oh, and Jim Henson, Kermit the Frog was on Sesame Street for a while. He was the news reporter and he did other segments like with the uh, letter W and so forth. And then Jim Henson felt it was a conflict of interest for some reason, and he took them off. Mm -hmm. So really, uh, Kermit the Frog now is officially with Miss Piggy and is a non-Sesame Street Muppet. Mm -hmm. Interesting. I, I want to talk a little bit about how Sesame Street's expanded across the globe these days. Oh. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's, it's in over... A, 150 countries and um, it reaches and, and there's an exciting new uh, adaptation of Sesame Street coming out for the Middle East, well, which is already out. It was finished production in 2019 and it's for the Middle East refugees and especially the Syrian refugees that won't see their home for maybe 20 years, these mm -hmm. poor children. And it, it talks about, and it deals with, unlike the original Sesame Street dealt with cognitive intellectual material, numbers, shapes, letters, classifying, sorting, math, and so forth. This one deals with emotions. It deals with loneliness. It deals with fear. It, it deals with happiness, it deals with loss, it deals with, oh my gosh, um, trying to remember what it was like growing up where they were, uh, mm -hmm. memories. And it, it, is, it will be interesting because Sesame Street does so much research and it'll be interesting to see how, how that works out and how effective they are in teaching the children strategies and coping with these emotions, as well as teaching them about them and how effective that show is. But it's a wonderful, wonderful, courageous courageous piece of work and um i'm really excited to see yeah. what happens there I, i'm curious because some other stuff this is not new for them and, and I, I love the fact of reading that in 2004 in kosovo they created a series for albanian kids and a series for serbian kids yes ruga zesem and ulika zizem i'm sure that i'm butchering my albanian my serb but uh that and they talk about you talk about going back and forth showing groups of one and groups of the other trying to show hey we're all just people here yeah we're all similar and they were trying to figure out how to do this and they developed this beautiful technique of juxtaposition and showing severe um the um what is it cosmo or kosovo kosovo yeah yeah children and then the Siberian children and doing the same thing, being with their grandmother and their grandparents and eating dinner and going to the post office and going shopping mm -hmm. and eating ice cream. And oh my gosh, it tolerance. We're all similar. We're all interconnected. It doesn't matter what ethnicity we are. Mm -hmm. And I also love this. You know, there's so many juicy little facts in here, like like learning the, the Oscar's voice from the cab driver. One of the other ones that I love is the fact that in Sesamstrat in the Netherlands, they have a baby pig. Oh, uh, Perk. <laughs> yes. And he's so popular that they that, named a tulip. Oh, they after. named a tulip after him. Yes. <laughs> and then I had to remember my childhood memory of growing up across the street from Joan Rivers house. And she had uh, her mother had rows and rows and rows of colorful tulips. And I go into describing these these juicy looking tulips. And she had a white picket fence. And one day I got and I was much younger than Joan Rivers. Um, and so I got my, and but I would go to her mother's house and entertain her because her father was a doctor and she was always alone. My sister and I actually would do that. And by entertaining her, we'd get some candy. But this time I took my 
Easter basket and I clipped all the beautiful, colorful tulips. I mean, you know, it wasn't long stems or anything, just clipped the heads of it, decorated my whole bottom of my Easter basket, rang her doorbell, rang her, uh, her doorbell and said to her, Chee, would you like to buy these tulips for five cents a piece? And she looked, uh, you, you know, she could see from my small frame all the all her stems waving in the breeze. And so, of course, she called my mother. <laughs> but it was lovely. And my father said to said to me or said to I remember some discussion of like, gee, she might be very good in business <laughs> or something. Well, I, I think it's turning out. And, and I have to tell you that I'm running out of time because I only have the 40 minute licensed version and we're 38 now. So oh. I want to thank you so much for, for being with us and really, really can't say enough about the book which is called The Inside Secrets of Sesame Street. Look for it everywhere. And Dr. Lucille Burbank, thanks so much for being with us. Oh, you welcome. My pleasure. How'd you get to Sesame?